Ronnie Ward from the Dipmas section of the Flatbush neighborhood, Brooklyn, in the city of New York. Today is Tuesday, the first day of October, 2024. October 1st, 2024. Happy 100th birthday, Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter turns 100 years old today, breaking his own record as the oldest living and longest lived former president in U.S. history. Carter has also had the longest presidential retirement, 43 years, but that retirement didn't slow him down. Carter's post-presidency is best known for his humanitarian work through Habitat for Humanity and the Carter Center, and he was awarded a Nobel Prize for Peace in 2022 for his advocacy of human rights and democracy. Happy 100th, Mr. President. James Carter, known as Jimmy, was born on October 1st, 1924, in the small town of Plains, Georgia. He grew up influenced by his father's talk of business, peanut farming, politics, and the family's commitment to the Baptist faith. Carter's humanitarian values were fostered by Rachel Clark, a black woman who was the wife of the family farm's foreman, and by his mother Lillian, a nurse who later volunteered in the Peace Corps. Upon graduating from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1946, he married Rosalind Smith and proceeded to serve in the Navy for seven years, much of that time on submarine duty. In 1953, Carter ended his military career after his father died. He moved back to Georgia with his wife and children to run the family business. to take a bigger interest in politics, first serving on the local school board and eventually serving two terms in the Georgia State Senate and one as governor. Though he initially lacked national recognition, Jimmy Carter became the Democratic nominee for president. Jimmy who? I heard he was a, a, a peanut farmer. I like the president. In 1976, he ran against Republican incumbent Gerald R. Ford and won. Carter built his campaign around trust, environmental reform, government efficiency, and removal of racial discrimination. You have given me a great responsibility. This inauguration ceremony marks a new beginning. He served as the 39th President of the United States from 1977 to 1981, amid tensions rising both domestically and internationally, including the Iran hostage crisis. Carter battled an economy suffering from high inflation, high unemployment, and slow growth. Despite this, he was able to tackle the country's energy crisis create the Department of Education and the Department of Energy and expand the national park system. He secured his legacy through his humanitarian accomplishments and successful mediation of peace between Egypt and Israel. These two Camp David agreements provide the basis for progress and peace throughout the Middle East. In 1980, he lost the presidency to Ronald Reagan. As I returned home to the South, where I was born and raised, I look forward to the opportunity to reflect and further to assess, I hope with accuracy, the circumstances of our times. Carter and Rosalind moved back to Georgia, where he continued his advocacy of social reform. I intend to give our new president my support 
And I intend to work as a citizen as I've worked here in this office as president for the values this nation was founded to secure. He acted as an unofficial diplomat abroad, supporting the democratization of elections. In 2002, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Even into their 90s, he and Rosalind frequently volunteered for Habitat for Humanity. And I would like to say, as a Christian, to these friends of mine, the words of Jesus, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be the children of God. Happy birthday, Mr. President. An interview with Jimmy Carter. Global challenges to the United States in a new millennium. The following interview was originally published in Britannica's Book of the Year 2024. Few people in the United States have a better overview of the state of the world than Jimmy Carter. He has been a submarine officer in the United States Navy, a successful peanut farmer, governor of Georgia, 71 to 75, the 39th president of the United States, 1971 to 88, and with his wife, Rosalind, founder of the Carter Center, 1982, an organization dedicated to the well-being of the world's people. In addition to his many other honors, Carter, received the 2002 Nobel Prize for Peace, now 79 years old in 2003. Carter is still very active in the Carter Center's projects, which include monitoring national elections, promoting peace through personal diplomacy, and eradicating or preventing tropical diseases such as river blindness, guinea worm disease, and trachoma. Since leaving the White House, he has written 18 books, including political memoirs, personal reminiscence, inspirational works, poetry, and most recently a novel. This written interview is excerpted from a conversation with Encyclopedia Britannica director of yearbooks Charles Trumbull at the Carter Center in Atlanta, Georgia on June 26, 2003. How would you characterize the state of the world in 2003? I think the world is deeply concerned and uncertain about the future. The number of conflicts on earth now is close to the highest in history. 
There is rapidly increasing wealth in the industrialized countries and a growing gap or chasm between the quality of life of those nations and the nations of the developing world. The status of the international community has changed dramatically in the last year. For the first time in human history, there is one undisputed superpower that is asserting its military strength. That strength of the United Nations. The strength of the United Nations has been dramatically challenged and potentially weakened. There is a lack of understanding or cooperation between Europe and the United States that is unprecedented in recent history. The effects of so-called globalization have not attenuated the disparities between the rich and the poor countries that may have accelerated them. The ability of people now in the poor nations to understand through mass media the degree of their economic plight has made them increasingly resentful as they can compare themselves with families in other nations and not just families in the next village. Yet the quality of life for people like me and most readers of Encyclopedia Britannica is improved every year by scientific and medical developments that hold promise for the future. The decrease in colonial or central authority in Russia, the former Yugoslavia, and throughout Africa has unleashed ethnic strife and tribal differences that were subdued under colonial influence in Africa and under the powerful central governments of the Soviet Union and Marshal Tito. But I believe most of our individual fears of terrorism in industrialized countries are unjustified. Statistically speaking, it is highly unlikely that any of us or our friends will be directly affected by terrorism, although the aftermath of the September 11, 2001 attacks has made us all extraordinarily fearful. Encyclopedia Britannica. Do you see terrorism or state terrorism as a new phenomenon? No. I think there has been an incipient element of terrorism for a long time. When I was president, we dealt with terrorism in the form of explosions, aircraft hijackings, and things of that kind, but there was not a worldwide awareness of it. Leaders were concerned, however, and we acted to try to control it. Encyclopedia Britannica. Would you agree that the history of the 20th century was a history of the clash between various ideologies, capitalism, communism, fascism, and so on? And if so, what do you think the arena for the 21st century is going to be? Will ideologies again be the issue, or will it be our cultural, ethnic, and social differences? Carter, in the few first few months of 2001, I gave several speeches addressing the question of the greatest challenge the world faces in the new millennium. My answer was the growing gap between rich and poor people. This is the preeminent potential element of conflict and dispute we face in the coming years. It is exacerbated by the growing sense of a religious difference that you have Muslims on one side and Christians on the other. And Christians, on the other, who have been identified, at least in the public conscience, as adversaries. Since the 9-11 terrorist attacks, this potential difference between Islam, the Christian world, has become a very important concern, almost an obsession for some people. I do not see it as justified, but it exists. Encyclopedia Britannica. You suggested in your Nobel Prize lecture that in the new era, nations will be called upon to cede some of their sovereignty to international organizations. Yet, in many ways, the United States seems to be backing away from initiatives that would limit its ability to act independently. For example, in the United Nations recently over Iraq, the World Trade Organization whenever it rules against the United States in regard to the International Criminal Court, and so on. Carter, here, let, let's, let's, let's watch this real quick. Oh, it's the same one. Maybe it's not. I mean, it's James not. Carter, known as Jimmy, was born on October 1st, 1925. Okay. 
Let's press on. Some of my Nobel address was targeted toward the United States and its recent policies, which concerned me very deeply, the inclination to bypass the United Nations or to um, rerogate its work and attempt to deal unilaterally with the problems of the world, trying to impose our will on others with military action as a very great and early possibility, not a last resort, a strong inclination proven by actions to abandon all the important international agreements that had been approved by presidents of the past and to prevent the implementation of agreements in the embryonic stage, including the International Criminal Court and the abandonment of the agreement at Kyoto concerning global warming. The Kyoto Agreement represented consensus reached after a decade or more of analysis of scientific facts laborious negotiation and trying to reach a common purpose. The United States now has separated itself publicly from most commitments it made and is also embarking on a new effort to develop new atomic weaponry as shown in the recent vote in Congress in support of deep penetrating nuclear bombs and the anti-ballistic missile placements that have recently been approved approved in Alaska and are now facing China and North Korea. Many of these departures from past policies, and I think, contravene the general premises espoused by the rest of the world and previous leaders of this country, regardless of our partisan commitments. Encyclopedia Britannica you have spoken frequently about the important role that non-governmental organizations and private initiatives have in alleviating some of the world's problems. Carter, a typical non-governmental organization is an organization divine for humanitarian or altruistic purposes. For example, to alleviate suffering, provide Proved environmental quality, promote freedom and democracy, or guarantee human rights. Second, although some NGOs may be bound by the purposes expressed by the founder or their heirs, many are adequately flexible and can deal without the restraints of complicated government structures, economies, and so forth, and can make decisions rapidly. Third, NGO representatives quite often work in areas of the world and among people of the world who are the most in need. If an NGO like the Carter Center devotes itself, say, to dealing with tropical diseases, we are on the ground in the villages and the homes of the people who suffer from these diseases. Another aspect of NGOs is that they have no special authority and could not have it even if they wanted it. The Carter Center has now observed 45 elections in the world. We go into those countries by invitation, and the first thing I always announce when I arrive is that we have no authority. All authority rests in the local government or its National Election Commission. I'm interested in your Encyclopedia Britannica. I'm interested in your humble use of the word authority. You claim that you have no authority. Yet you have enormous authority when you go into a country. The personal dimensions of your involvement with the Carter Center gives you an enormous amount of sway, does it not? Carter, well, there is certainly moral authority and in the influence of my voice on behalf of the Carter Center. Quite often, we monitor an election side by side with representatives of the United Nations. On election day, if I see something going wrong, I have no reluctance to take it up directly with the head of the ruling party, the president or the prime minister. If that is unsuccessful, I'm not shy about calling an international press conference and saying, this is wrong and the ruling party should take action to change it. When the election is over, I have no reticence about saying, this election was faulty and I do not believe the will of the people was represented. Encyclopedia Britannica. How do you view some of the other grand-scale personal efforts to alleviate suffering? I am thinking particularly of rock musician Bob Geldof, who earlier this year called for a Marshall Plan for Africa. Geldof said that during the Marshall Plan for Europe, 
1% of the gross national product of the United States went to rebuilding Europe, and that the same thing could be done in Africa with one point. The United States of Europe and the United States of Africa have selected their own bad fellow, so let them jump in the bed, pull up the satin sheets and satin pillows, and start crying on them. I, Carter, I think we could do it if we invested 0.1% of the U.S. GNP, <laughs> gross national product, for humanitarian aid. By the way, the humanitarian aid figure from the U.S. government is the lowest percentage of any industrialized country in the world. European countries give about four times much. Norway gives about seven times as much per capita. Encyclopedia Britannica. You set up the Carter Center 21 years ago. What was your mission then and what is your vision now, say, looking 20 years out? To 2023, they would be saying. They were quite different. Jimmy Carter, the Axis Mundi of his own efforts, 21 years back, 21 years forward. Oh my God, 2003, 21 years back, 21 years forward, from the founding of the Carter Center to 2023 to 2024, which is this year, right now, and it's October 1st, 2024. They were quite different. When we conceived the Carter Center, Rosalind and I had the very limited vision of creating here at Camp David in miniature. I thought I would deal exclusively with conflicts or potential conflicts in the world, analyze their causes and the principles of the parties involved. And after my services as a mediator, as I had mediated between Israel and Egypt at Camp David Accords in 1978, and that led to the peace treaty between these countries. Yet yeah, Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger negotiated a peace treaty as well during the last, his second term in office. I also point out that Richard Nixon opened diplomatic relations along with Henry Kissinger with um, um, the People's Republic of China as well. And today, the cover first is the um, anniversary of the People's Republic of China. We still do that, but the Carter Center has evolved because I realized that my earlier commitments to human rights and to peace were primarily predicated on my limited viewpoint as a president and governor. I did not understand that intense personal hunger and suffering from preventable diseases was such a terrible problem. I did not know about all the poor countries I know well today. Now over half our total effort is devoted to health programs, the most remarkable problem Progress is against Guinea worm disease. Incidents have been reduced from 3.5 million when the eradication campaign began to less than 50,000 a day, and almost three fourths of those are in southern Sudan, where we cannot reach some of the villages because of the civil war. The Carter Center has extended its vision to encompass a much broader range of human rights, not only civil and political rights such as freedom of speech, freedom of mistreatment by authorities, and the right to self-governance, but social and economic rights, including environmental concerns, alleviation of suffering, and the right to health care. You have mentioned the 9-11 attacks several times today. How have those events changed your thinking or the policies of the Carter Center? Carter, I, it really has not changed our policies. I was pleasantly surprised after 9-11 that the worldwide support for the Carter Center went up noticeably. Many people saw the Carter Center as an element of international stability that we operate across ethnic and religious lines in mundane communities like growing more rice on a farm or treating children for river blindness and realized that we dealt with all kinds of governments and leaders equitably. So. As far as the Carter Center was concerned, 9-11 was a terrible atrocity, but not an adverse factor on our own projects. Nor for the American people, I would say. Nope, we just observed the 23rd remembrance of the falling of the World Trade Center. Myself, 
I was in Brooklyn Heights on Montague Street at the foot of Montague on the promenade with many other Brooklynites and others from wherever they might be looking across the river east over to the lower part of Manhattan and the Brooklyn Bridge and uh, waiting for the big moment sometime after dusk when the mighty lights burst up into the sky into beams I've never seen I've seen it on television I've never seen it in person oh my goodness lights lights I can't imagine what kind of lights they even are two beams going straight up into the sky as far as you I couldn't even see the end of the light it just dissipated up but I know this, the only reason I can see it is because those lamps put out energy and photons and started a wave of energy going up through the atmosphere, and it kept going, 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 going. I never even say anything like it. it is I, uh, as I commented, I think, at least to myself and I think some others, it reminded me immediately of Jacob's Ladder. Yes. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob's ladder, wrestling with angels going up and down a ladder. And I just remarked and said, yeah, it is. It's the souls of those of 9-11 and those of the world that are traveling up to heaven and back down again so that those in heaven can come down to earth and travel up and down and well, we just don't have any wrestling anymore. No, it's just a pathway for the spirits of the world, all the world, yep, up to the heavens and back. That's what I thought. That's what I mentioned to someone. One of Lula's first acts as president was to declare the, n that nobody in Brazil should be without housing, as if to underline his determination. Lula concealed a very large order of military equipment. Carter... That is a very good move. We have tried to encourage all that over Latin America. The leader in this regard is Costa Rica, a country that devotes all its resources to non-military purpose. Zimbabwe, you were present at the creation, were you not? I think I spent more time working on the issues of Zimbabwe than I did on the Middle East peace process. It seems to be a country that is on the brink. It is because of malfeasance and mal in administration of President Robert Mugabe. What is the way out to find some... What a long interview. My goodness. This pesky encyclopedia Britannica. No Pax Romana. No Pax Britannica. No Pax Americana. To find some means to terminate his leadership, I do not see any way out as long as he is the leader. Iraq. Do you think that Iraqis had weapons of mass destruction in the spring of 2023? Well, I know they had weapons of mass destruction in the era of the Iran-Iraq war. They used them, I think, with the knowledge of the United States. Maybe by this time the interview is published. My opinion, well, not. Who knows when the interview was? My opinion will not amount to anything. Yeah, because this is just chatter, 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 chatter. But it's an American. I'm proud to be an American. Yeah, maybe. Oh, thank you, Jimmy Carter. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I have enjoyed talking with you. Okay, well, where? Who killed Tupac Shore? What's it say? Let's see. Here it is. Let's read it. I think it's still a mystery. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. There's a lot of things that are mystery. I, there's a mystery everywhere. Agatha Christie's mysteries, have they solved those? Hercule Perrault, I don't know. Who killed Tupac Kashur? Shakur. Tupac Shakur died on September 13, 1996, six days after a gunman in a white Cadillac shot him down, shot him four times in the chest at a spotlight in at a spot stoplight in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Times published 2022, determined that uncooperative witnesses and minimal pursuit of gang-related leads resulted in what became an unsolved homicide case. 
The first part of this widely read investigation, written by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Chuck Phillips, provided an in depth analysis of the Nobel. What the heck is a Nobel Prize winner doing writing about Tupac Shakur? I'm done reading this right now. My goodness. Who cares? Or as they say, who gives a F bleep ing? Ronnie Ward from the Dipma section of the Flatbush neighborhood, Brooklyn. Why is the dove of peace sitting on the ground? It's on the ground, a dove of peace. Gosh darn it. Thank you, Jimmy Carter. I'm glad to know that the Nobel Prize folks in this year thought that the dove of peace should be groveling around on the ground. Oh, my goodness. Oh, gosh. Well, <laughs> October, Tuesday, the first day of October 2024. The terminus of the 42 years spanning the beginning of the Carter Center to today at the Axis Mundi of the time being no. <laughs> September 2023. Oh my gosh. Keep thinking the good thoughts. Th 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 that's all, folks.